So occasionally whenever I'm making videos for this channel, things happen organically. A cool guitar comes out, a cool story happens, and you have to just pull out your camera and film. And that's what this video is. Last week I went and bought this guitar, my first vintage guitar. This is a 1965 Gibson SG Jr. And while we were down at Maple Street Guitars filming the video, which if you haven't seen, you can check it out here. My friend Lindsay, who sold me this guitar, was telling me the reason he was selling this and some other guitars from his collection. And it was to acquire his dream guitar, a 1943 Martin D28. So I asked if we could check it out and he kindly obliged. And I didn't expect it, but I ended up playing the best sounding acoustic guitar I've ever heard in my life that day. Not only that, but Lindsay then showed me some of the other guitars that he's selling from his collection to acquire that Martin, and they are uh, equally as cool and amazing. So that's today's video. Now, before we go back to Maple Street Guitars, I wanna announce that yes, these guitars are for sale. These are guitars that Lindsay is selling to buy his Martin. This video is in no way sponsored by Maple Street. Lindsay didn't ask me to make this video. I'm doing this to help out a friend, to help him acquire uh, his dream guitar. So if you're in the market or interested in any of these guitars that Lindsay has, I'm gonna have his info and the info to Maple Street Guitars linked down in the description box below. If you're interested, contact them directly and work it out. And uh, hopefully through this community, through this video, we can help Lindsay, an amazing player and a really cool guy, acquire his dream guitar. And if one of you out there ends up buying one of his guitars, you're gonna end up like me with something incredibly special and unique. So enough talking, let's go check out this Martin. So I guess this is it, this is what's worth cashing in so many chips. Oh man. Once again, Hopper approves, actually he's scratching himself. This is a 1943 D28. The uh, war era D28s are perhaps just second to pre-war but um, speaking from experience, uh, you know, the real thing that makes them, you know, so distinctive is they still have scallop bracing, ah. which Martin abandoned in late 1944, mid 1944, and thus began a transformation of the, well, the fundamental guitar tone that they were producing, but um, the tapered braces that they move to have created a much more mid forward kind of sound where the scallop braces had tremendous low end. I also kind love that it's got the engraving of the... Yeah, we don't know who this is yet, but there's um, the name, what we can take out is like Bea, B-E-A, Raker. Perfectly balanced. 
I know. It's lots of low end. It's really present in the bottom end, but there's enough top end to. Wow. And it's just got that presence, like you say. That's a that's a lifer. Like most great things, you're not expecting it, and it like just comes into your life, and you go, "Shit, <laughs> I, I got. I, I think I have to acquire this." That's and, what happened to me on Saturday. Yeah. we were just down. I was like, "Oh, let's just stop in and go say hey." We haven't uh, been down in a while, and you guys got anything cool? And you're like, "Yeah, actually, I do." <laughs> Here we are. War era ones like this will have an ebony reinforcement in the neck because oh. of the uh, rationing of metal. Right. So as a result, they usually have kind of a lighter uh, neck feel. And a lot of guys will kind of act suspicious about that. But you know, the reality is a, a piece of wood on its edge, like if you had a two by four on its right. edge, super strong. Right. So case in point, like you can look at this guitar and over 80 years, the neck is like <laughs> dead straight. Where um, even truss rod, you know, equipped necks sometimes develop like warping and stuff in them that you can't adjust out right and that's they were a little bit lighter built you know so is that a case for the case yes okay whoa that's a 1929 triple 018 <laughs> oh my god um, and this one is kind of cool because, for one, it was part of a, a batch that were mislogged by Martin, a very rare thing. Okay. So for many years, until I actually acquired this guitar, Martin thought it was a double O. Um, but it was part of 24 that were mislogged. And uh, right in 1930, Martin transitioned to the Belly Bridge that we all know and love. But this guitar was built, or rolled off the line, I guess, December 12th of 29. And so it was an early belly bridge. This is a replica because the original one had been sanded down with a poor neck set when I got the guitar. But uh, mahogany, Adirondack top, 12th fret, doesn't get much more resonant than this. And I think this bad boy weighs like right around three pounds. Oh my God. It's like it's not there. I know. It's air guitar. Yeah, literally. <laughs> like, I. I've never touched a lighter, a lighter guitar. It's like your brain is telling you there should be more there, but right. there's not. It's like a classical. It's one seven eight inches, so that's it's like the same string spacing as a classical. guitar stories that I've had in my career where um, the guy who sold me this instrument showed up one day kind of rough and ready dude but he found this guitar in Goodwill and he paid forty dollars for it <laughs> it's perhaps the finest example of its type I've ever seen okay uh, so this is a 1928 018 Koa oh man 
which just has some like really stunning koa. And these were Hawaiian guitars, you know, it's a little known fact that some of the first guitars built for exclusively for steel strings were made for lap applications. Right. So um, this was a Hawaiian, so it had flush frets and um, a bridge that had no compensation in the saddle. Okay. So um, a lot of people will convert them. I kind of made a questionable call on this one in that I left the fingerboard flat and reinstalled bar frets okay. such that if anyone ever wanted to like take it back down to its original state they could and right. it would be basically what it was originally but um was it, it was it always a round neck yes so it was a round neck lap steel yeah weird pretty neat yeah but um a single o so this is you know a little bit you know more focused voice but it's still a big voice It sounds light, but that's not the right word to describe it. It's, it's loud. It's punchy. There's a lot of mid range, a lot of low mid to it. It's also just a very present guitar. There's a very immediate kind of quality of sound to it, but you know, it has this kind of surprising depth for its size. Yeah. yeah it's a lot more low end than you would think for a guitar of this size. The Koa you know, has a hardwood top. Hardwood tops in general, like mahogany and koa, in my experience, have a drier kind of response, more so with mahogany. But like, there's this kind of punchiness in the low end that the spruces don't really yield. So there's this surprising amount of bass response in those guitars usually. Yeah. And the koa is a little bit more unusual in that over time, it ages. It becomes this kind of more mature, kind of slightly darker, quality of sound, even though it skews on the brighter end of the spectrum. Right. So, uh, so beautiful, man. Yeah. And, and the, the pattern on that, the grain pattern on that, the flame is gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, for its age, you know, 94 years old, no cracks, no major gouges or anything like a guitar, and it was in good will with no case and no bridge. <laughs> the guy said, that it was $40, but he only had 20 on him. So he stood there in goodwill with it for like an hour until a friend with 20 extra bucks would show up to so he could buy the guitar. <laughs> so once again, a guitar that just walked into the store one day. A lot of these are actually. But, uh, and then, like I said, with your SG Junior, it never made the sales floor. Um, but I was sitting right there in the office and I looked out there and my mother was talking to this other elderly lady and out came this guitar and I kind of like levitated out of my, you know, like, you know, thing. I just went out there and, um, so this is an unusual guitar, but fans of Elvis Costello or, um, uh, certainly Elizabeth Cotton mm -hmm. freight train will know this guitar. This is a 1933 L century. What? These were built for the century of progress, um, exhibition in Chicago in 1933. And Gibson made this and an accompanying mandolin basically to demonstrate that they could work with what we all love as mother of toilet seat. Um, so the earliest ones had that for the fingerboard, which is actually maple with that laminated on there. This, is a, this was a guitar that um, belonged to a woman who played the hell out of it. So it's had some rough wear, but these were kind of distinctive L00s that uh, were that maple, wow. you know? Some really beautiful kind of curl on the back there as well as the side. Nothing sounds like these. Let's see, I want to hear you play this one.
this one's kind of a, a funky guitarist. To my knowledge, I'm the technically the third owner, but it, I bought it from the son of the original owner. Okay. And this was one of those kind of like museum finds. It came in an original Guybe case, um, had boxes of unopened black diamond strings, uh, a pickup and with an amp and all cable and all this kind of stuff, but it was like magically untouched, save the pickguard. Unfortunately, my home was robbed and the, the thieves left this guitar on the wall but took the case, which was probably worth like, you know, a thousand bucks on its own because right. it was so clean. And uh, I was left with this, so it has a newer case, but this is a, a 34L4, which apart from some finish crazing, is super clean. So this of course is characteristic of so many Gibsons. They would formulate their lacquer with a retarder that allowed the uh, finish to flex a little bit more. If it got frozen, it got more brittle. Yeah. And so uh, this is why with like a lot of old Gibsons, if electric or acoustic, if you find one that has like a dusty kind of feel to it, don't try to clean that guitar because mm. that, that lacquer is a thermoplastic. It doesn't ever crystallize yeah. and you'll end up with like smudge mm. and a very frustrating afternoon. Yeah. Um, but shortly after this year, these went to um, an F-hole design. And so the circular hole ones have like this real percussive kind of thing. Like, I mean, Django could have played this guitar. Right. You know, it has that kind of gypsy, jazz gypsy cut. Um, great rhythm instrument, so loud. Thank you. 